Hello, my name is Lucy Knox and I'm a second year medical student at Swansea University. During this video, I'm going to take you through the anatomy of the urinary system. By the end of this session, I hope that you'll gain an understanding of the key anatomy of the urinary system, both of males and females, as well as understanding the clinical relevance of this anatomy. I'm also going to go through some imaging techniques commonly used. I have also created an anatomy spotter style exam for you to do at the end of this test and also I'd recommend that you go to the anatomy lab to look at the models. I'm going to start by looking at the kidneys. Where are they? The kidneys sit at the level of the 12th thoracic vertebrae, sitting just in front of the 12th rib. The left kidney is slightly higher up than the right kidney as the right kidney sits underneath the liver and it's pushed down slightly. Drawing the body in cross-section, you can see that the kidneys sit in the abdominal cavity. They sit in the posterior part of this, towards the back. They sit below the diaphragm. The kidneys are retroperitoneal organs, which means that they're not covered completely by parietal and visceral pleura, like the rest of the contents of the abdominal cavity. The bladder is also retroperitoneal in the pelvic cavity. We're now going to look at the blood supply of the kidneys. The kidneys receive 20% of the cardiac output, which is a huge amount considering their size. Starting with the veins, we can see that the renal veins drain directly into the inferior vena cava as it ascends up the abdomen. The kidneys are supplied by renal arteries, which are lateral branches of the abdominal aorta. As they enter the kidneys, then they split to form interlobar arteries. As the left renal vein crosses the aorta, it sits just inferior to the superior mesenteric artery, which can compress the vein if it becomes engorged. This is sometimes called nutcracker syndrome. Bizarrely, this can cause testicular pain in men, as the left testicular vein drains into the left renal vein before joining the inferior vena cava, a remnant of their embryological positioning. I'm going to go through the parenchyma of the kidney now. That's the functional tissue of the organ. The parenchyma consists of an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The cortex seen here with little dots and the medulla in red. To understand the layout of the kidney, it's important to get an overview of the filtering apparatus of the kidneys, the nephron. Uh, each kidney contains about 800,000 nephrons. I'm not going to go into the precise physiological detail of how nephrons work, um, as this would take a whole other tutorial, but I'll take you through their basic anatomy. The kidneys exist to filter blood to produce urine. Blood arrives at the nephron via afferent arterioles. They supply the glomerular capillaries, which form a little bunch inside the Bowman's capsule. Blood then leaves via efferent arterioles. About 20% of the blood's volume is forced out of the glomerular capillaries into the Bowman's capsule. This is called the filtrate. The filtrate enters the proximal convoluted tubule, where reabsorption of ions, water and organic nutrients occur. It then descends into the loop of Henle, which plunges into the medulla. This is where urine is concentrated by the reabsorption of water as it descends and the absorption of sodium and chloride as it descends, setting up a concentration gradient. The distal convoluted tubule leads on from the loop of Henle, where selective secretion and absorption occurs to help maintain pH and electrolyte levels in the blood. It finally enters the collecting duct, which descends into the medulla and funnels the urine. ADH acts on the collecting ducts by increasing the permeability to water, so more water is reabsorbed into the blood, concentrating the urine when ADH is present. I'm now going to go through the gross anatomy of the kidneys. As we know, the renal vein and artery enter and exit the kidney via the hilum. The kidney is also surrounded by a layer of perinephric fat, which acts as a protective mechanism in case of trauma. The renal medulla is arranged as a series of pyramids. In between these pyramids are extensions of the cortex. This is called the renal column, or sometimes called columns of Bertin. Surrounding the renal pyramids is the cortex. Following the route of urine from the medulla, we see that they exit the pyramids into minor calices, which are like funnels. These then drain into major calices and then into the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis is a direct continuation of the ureter. The apex of each renal pyramid, which drains into a minor calyx, is called the renal papilla. And the outer layer of the kidney is called the renal capsule. This is a tough, fibrous layer. 
Connecting the kidneys and the bladder is the ureters. We have a pair of ureters that run down through the abdominal cavity into the pelvis to connect to the bladder. The lumen of the ureters is lined by transitional epithelium. This, with the lamina propria, makes up the mucosa. The ureters can help repel urine by peristalsis, thanks to the longitudinal and circular muscle layers. The course of the ureters have three points where it has a big clinical impact. Kidney stones can form and pass down the ureters into the bladder. This can be an excruciating process. There are three key places where kidney stones can get stuck on their route from the kidney to the bladder. These are labelled with these arrows. Firstly, the uteropelvic junction, which could be influenced by the angle of the renal pelvis. Secondly, as the ureter crosses the pelvic inlet, where it crosses over the external and internal iliac arteries. Thirdly, as it enters the bladder, it must go through the thick layer of detrusor muscle. Looking at more detail at the bladder, you can see that the bladder is the fibromuscular organ. Its function is to store urine before it can be expelled. It sits in the true pelvis and is covered by a layer of peritoneum. The ureters both pierce the wall of the bladder, which is made up of a thick layer of detrusor muscle. The inner layer of the bladder is wrinkled, made up of rugi. This mucosal layer is made up of transitional epithelium. The area between the ureters and the urethral orifice is called the trigone. This area is more fixed in place and therefore isn't wrinkled. As urine exits the bladder, it does so via the urethral orifice into the urethra. This is controlled by the internal urethral sphincter as well as an external urethral sphincter. The end of the urethra is called the urethral meatus or the external urethral orifice. In females, the urethra is shorter and straighter than in males. It is only 4 cm long. In the next two diagrams, I'm going to draw the pelvis in cross section, both males and females, so that we can see the relations of the bladder and urethra. In females first, the bladder is the most anterior organ. It sits just posterior to the pubic symphysis, with the urethra descending just anterior to it. The uterus sits just superior to the bladder, with the vagina descending posteriorly to it. The rectum and anus is then posterior to that. The abdominal peritoneum sits above these organs, lying on them almost like a pie crust. As the bladder shares space with the uterus and vagina in the pelvis, it means during pregnancy the bladder can be compressed, causing discomfort and increased urgency. Moving on to the male pelvis. The bladder also sits directly posterior to the pubic synthesis. The urethra is longer in males and descends via the penis. The male reproductive organs are also in the pelvis. The ductus deferens ascends from the testes in the scrotum around the bladder and joins into the urethra along with secretions from the seminal vesicles. The male bladder is also covered by a layer of peritoneum. As the course of the male urethra is longer, I'm going to go through the details of it separately. The prostate gland in men sits just inferior to the bladder. The urethra has to pass through this, which can become a problem if the prostate enlarges, such as in prostate cancer. The male urethra is split into different parts. The preprostatic part, as it leaves the bladder, the prostatic part, while it's in the prostate, the membranous part, as it leaves the prostate before it enters the penis, and the spongy part, or penile part. The male urethra is also controlled by sphincters, the internal urethral sphincter just above the prostate and the external urethral sphincter, which controls the membranous part of the urethra. Having looked at the anatomy of the urinary tract, I'm now going to look at some of the imaging techniques used to understand it better and to deal with problems that occur. To do this, I'm going to look at urinary tract stones. This is sometimes called urolithiasis. The stones are formed in the kidney, where they're called renal calculi. They're formed when the urine becomes too saturated with salt and minerals, and the stones themselves can be made up of different salts and minerals, such as calcium oxalate, struvite, uric acid, and cysteine. 60 to 80% of the stones we see contain some sort of calcium. Their composition determines whether they can be seen on different types of imaging, which is why we use a number of different types of imaging when we look at urinary tract stones. I'm going to go through some of the common modalities used. I'm going to start with KUB X-ray. 
This is an x-ray showing the kidneys, ureters and bladder. It can be very difficult to visualise the normal routes of the ureters on KEB x-rays. The proximal section runs on the medial surface of the serous muscle. The middle section passes just anterior to the sacroiliac joint and the lower section moves more medially to join the bladder. It can be quite obvious to see stones on a KEB x-ray, as you can see in this image. However, not all stones can be visualised, as some are radiotranslucent. The next image shows quite a dramatic staghorn calculi. This occurs when a large renal calculi forms in the calyces and pelvis of the kidney. I'm now going to go through non-contrast CT scanning. This is the gold standard imaging technique, as it doesn't require any patient preparation and almost all stones can be seen on it. No contrast is used, so allergy isn't an issue. If no stones are present, then other pathologies can also be picked up, such as renal masses. The arrows are indicating stones in different locations. Here in a sagittal view, we can see the stone is stuck just above the bladder. In an axial view, it's a little bit easier to see which level it's at. This axial view has been tilted slightly so you can see the full course of the ureter. I've highlighted the ureter here in a coronal section of the same patient. Non-contrast CT scanning has largely replaced IVU, intravenous urography, which used to be the gold standard when imaging urinary tract stones. A contrast containing iodine is given to the patient via IV access. A scouting x-ray is taken before the contrast has entered the body to see if there are any radio-opaque stones present. With an eye of faith, you may just be able to see a stone in the circle. A KUB x-ray is then performed 10 minutes after the contrast is given. Already you can see a difference. The left-hand side of the patient, on the right of the screen, has excreted the contrast much more quickly than the right-hand side of the patient. Another KUB x-ray is taken 15 minutes after the contrast was given. Here you can see a slight narrowing indicated by the arrow, which could be a stone blocked in the ureter which is slowing the excretion of the contrast. A similar procedure can be done using CT scanning. This is able to give functional and anatomical detail. Only one image is taken, which does mean it's less dynamic than the IVU. However, it gives much better detail in the anatomy. In the following images, the blue arrow is pointing at the patient's right ureter. The images are taken in an axial view. And so as we move down the images, we can see the ureter as it travels through the abdomen and towards the bladder. You can see it here as it's just about to enter the bladder. And here you can see the bladder is filling with contrast. I'm finally going to look at ultrasound imaging. This is a non-invasive, quick and cheap type of imaging and can give you good results. It does however have the big disadvantage that it is easy to miss stones in ultrasound and suffers from operational bias. In the following images, the blue arrow is pointing at different calculi you can see, firstly in the kidney, in the ureter, and finally we can see a large calculi in the bladder. So this concludes my video. I hope it's helped you get a better understanding of the anatomy of the urinary tract, as well as some of the imaging techniques that are sometimes used in it. I've also created an anatomy spotter style test to test the knowledge that you've gained. And at the end of that, I've left a list of recommended reading in case you want to learn more. Thank you for listening. I hope it's been useful.